The floor is open for questions, comments, either on individual countries or on the overview and the totality of the impact of this group on the world economy and what it might imply. The floor is open. Please go to the microphone, uh, introduce yourself, and fire away. Start in the back. Bill Klein here at the Institute. Uh, John, did that 6% seems awfully high if you think about the prospects. I mean, my reading of Brazil is that it continues, as you say, to have a low investment rate, to have a high real interest rate. Uh, the implied uh, capital, incremental capital output ratio, if you compare India and China on the one hand uh, and Brazil, if Brazil were to be able to sustain 6% growth, would be a little bit hard to believe because India and China are throwing 40% of GDP at investment. They're getting 8%. That's a ratio of 5. Brazil is probably only investing about 20%. So I, I'm a little bit skeptical that you can continue the 6%. Uh, and also, at least there's a perception that Brazil has this uh, tax structure that uh, discourages uh, investment, that it's got a disproportionately high tax burden uh, for a country at its income level. So maybe you could say about a little bit about whether that 6% is, is really sustainable without some, uh, some major changes. And maybe uh, perhaps Arvind could say, um, should we think that the performance in India is that great if they, if they have such a high incremental capital operation? Okay, let's, accum let's accumulate questions and then we'll group them for the answers. Uh, next. Yes, I'm Bert Keidel, at the economist in the China program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I wanted to ask two questions, one of Nick and one of you, Fred. Um, Nick, I liked, uh, of course, your very good presentation of the impact of the decline in the trade surplus on China's GDP growth and some of the pressures that that brings. But I wondered if you could say how much wiggle room there is in your short-term projection of, say, 8 uh, percent for next year. We We've seen actually, a, if you take the month on month inflation number uh, for August, inflation actually declined about 0.9 percent. Uh, and that's a 10 percent annual rate. And this triggered uh, the symbolic government reduction in, in lending rates that says they're no longer concerned about inflation the way they were a year ago. And so that we can expect to see a revival of investment flows. They've been struggling for several years since the SARS crisis. Uh, to deal with the overheating that, they, that emerged in 2004 and that then led to a lot of inflationary pressures in food. The grain harvest seems to have been coming online this year. 510 metric tons is what they're looking for, million metric tons. So if, in fact, they think that inflation is beaten, and I think they use the same kind of seasonally adjusted numbers rather than year on year uh, that they publish for inflation, wouldn't, don't they have the capability through their directed credit or the way they control credit, as John Anderson said, just follow the net lending data to really speed up this economy again uh, and therefore maintain growth in the domestic level? The, uh, the household survey data on consumption show real household growth so far this year in the first half of uh, about 10 percent. Uh, okay. And Next. Fred, could you just mention on your uh, – Delineation of the of the of the reserves, where China seems to be way out ahead, uh, that's in trillion dollars, and the country, those economies are very different size. What's your comment on the importance of comparing reserves to money supply and the ability of a country's economy to have a demand for foreign exchange? Because there, China is way below uh, all those other countries up there in terms of its uh, reserves as a share of money supply uh, on a comparable basis. Next. Uh, my question is concerning. Please identify. Uh, Andre Ilario of the Kate Institute. Uh, my question concerns uh, our, for uh, uh, concern the possible political consequences of the some kind of medium to long term forecast that you were discussing today. Uh, by 2025 or even longer, maybe by 2030 or 2040. It uh, looks like that uh, more than a half of GDP will almost definitely will be produced in the countries that are not considered to be liberal democracies. Even for India, as we know, Farid Zakaria claimed that it is democracy, but probably not too very liberal. Certainly we cannot say it is 
at all uh, about China, today China at least, and today's Russia. So in some foreseeable future, we can have uh, the situation in which uh, at least half of the world GDP, or maybe even more, will be produced in the countries that are not liberal democracy, which will be absolutely new phenomena compared to the previous century. So what kind of consequences you are expecting for the world order, economic order, political order, and international relations, especially in view of recent actions of Russian government in the Caucasus? Okay. Surjit Man Singh, American University. Um, Arvind Subramaniam mentioned the surprisingly high level of outgoing Indian investment to OECD countries. Without explaining the causes, my question is, do domestic politics within India discourage investment by Indians inside India and therefore provide incentives for them to go abroad? Yep. Eric McVeigh in the Institute of Foreign Policy Analysis. Nick, would you say something about the scandals in China, the dangerous, poor quality products and so forth, the implications for that uh, for the future and anything else you think interesting? <laughs> you want another speech, in other words. <laughs> Danny? Danny Leipziger from the World Bank. Uh, my question is to you, Fred. I mean, the individual country cases could be analyzed, but the reason for the uh, trillion dollar club is that presumably taken in the aggregate, these countries will have tremendous impact. Uh, so far, as a, as a constellation of countries, their political impact has been sort of on the negative side. I mean, you alluded to China and India being uh, not that helpful in the Doha uh, round. Uh, looking at uh, the G20 or other constellations where these uh, countries meet, they don't seem to be able to contribute a lot to the system. And I'm not saying the system is not biased, but um, so what is your what is your prognosis? Because the economic side of it is relatively clear, plus or minus a few percentage points, but the political side is not clear at all. Yep. Uh, Carl Dahlman, Georgetown University. A question for Arvind on India. I mean, given this dramatic increase in the rate of growth in India, over 8 percent, now 9, a lot of it is due to this increase in investment. And we all know it's been very hard to get countries to increase their investment rate. How did India manage to go from 20-some to over 40? to 40 percent in just 15 years, because that's a, a key element of the growth, and it's very hard for policy to accomplish that. So how did it happen? Steve? Steve Beckman, uh, retired from the UAW. One of the, uh, one of the issues that uh, distinguishes these countries is, uh, is the sort of status of, of independent unions and uh, the mechanism for ensuring that uh, income is distributed to uh, to workers, consumers, so that uh, there's some equity. There was an emphasis on the investment rates, uh, less uh, discussion of uh, how, uh, how much incomes are growing and, and how these economies will be affected by differences in the way income is, uh, is distributed. So if you could talk a little bit about the political and economic consequences uh, of uh, income distribution policies and the role of uh, independent uh, unions and other organizations in that process. I'd appreciate it. Okay. I think that will be the first round of questions. Let me ask my colleagues to respond in the same order that we spoke. Uh, Nick, Arvin, Anders, John, and then I'll come back to the two overview questions. And I'd ask each of my colleagues to be sure to try to answer Steve's last question on income distribution and uh, worker rights. Nick? <coughs> Well, uh, in response to Bert's question, I, I did try to say I think there's certainly the room for monetary easing now. China has had some progress on bringing inflation down, at least as measured by the CPI. On the other hand, the producer price index is still rising. It's over 10 percent. So we may get some resurgence of consumer prices uh, sometime over the next few quarters. I, I'm agnostic on that. I don't really have a view. But I certainly think there's room for monetary easing. But the question I think I mentioned in my remarks is, uh, if a third of the uh, manufacturing sector has sharply declining profitability because exports are softening and the construction sector, which accounts for, by the time you consider the upstream portion, accounts for 20 percent of GDP, uh, is uh, going through a correction of some sort, uh, then I, I question whether or not monetary easing is going to be sufficient uh, 
uh, to increase uh, investment in, in either the property or the manufacturing uh, sector. So I'm a little um, worried that the policy instruments that they've embarked on so far, cutting interest rates as they did about 10 days ago, are going to have the, uh, the, the, um, the right effect. It may be, like, may be very similar to the late 90, or 90, 98, 99 period when monetary easing was not, uh, not very effective. Um, uh, Eric's question, I would just say this uh, confirms to him the food scandal just confirms to me the huge mistake of the Bush administration last year when it congratulated itself on signing a whole series of agreements with the Chinese on food and product safety in which the main claim was we don't have to do anything. The Chinese have agreed to increase their inspections and the quality and so forth and so on and I thought it was uh, uh, ludicrous for uh, anybody to expect that a country with a per capita income of $2,500 is going to be able to enforce uh, standards that would be appropriate for us, and I think the, the milk scandal uh, shows that. On unions, obviously China has uh, had a, a period now of very sharply rising income inequality. It's a function of a, a number of factors, certainly the liberalization of the labor market, uh, the financial repression. Uh, that uh, I think has uh, substantially reduced the growth of disposable income because uh, interest income has declined uh, as a share of GDP even as uh, household savings as a share of GDP has uh, gone up. Uh, those factors have uh, led to a, a decline in uh, household wages as a share of GDP and, and disposable income as a share of GDP uh, and there's been a substantial worsening of income distribution um, as well, not to the Brazilian levels uh, that John was describing, but it's it's moving in that direction fairly fairly sharply. Arvin, <clears throat> thanks. Um, uh, three quick responses. One, um, what are the causes of outward flows of FDI, and uh, is domestic politics responsible for it? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think. Um, now we see a lot of triumphalism about this outward flow. At some point, uh, it's going to turn into this kind of Ross Perot kind of, you know, giant sucking sound, you know, capitalists fleeing India and, 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 and letting Indian labor down. Uh, but, but the fact still remains that uh, on balance, it's still, I think, a positive phenomenon because the fact is that private investment is, is rising very sharply in India. So it cannot be the case that things are so bad and all of this is just a, a push factor uh, out of India. And of course, even if it were a push factor, the point is that uh, there are push factors out of many countries. Uh, why is it that Indian entrepreneurship can be so successful where others can't? So, so it's still, I would say, on balance, a positive development. Um, how did in investment increase? Uh, how did private investment increase? Um, uh, in India? It's a very good question again. Uh, and, and I think there are probably uh, two or three uh, uh, factors that contributed to it. One, of course, no question, you know, the reforms after 1991 meant that uh, uh, the, the atmosphere for the private sector was just dramatically different after that. But I think that was the trigger. Uh, uh, India had some underlying strengths, you know, in terms of its skills and in terms of, you know, the fact that, you know, however illiberal it was, it was still a, a functioning democracy. There was rule of law, good institutions. So it was that interaction between the trigger of reforms plus some fundamental strengths. And, and then, then, of course, uh, uh, the growth process itself took over. I mean, private investment didn't increase in India for at least 10 years into the, into the reform process. So, so, so there was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, growth being a bit of a confidence uh, trick, right? I mean, growth grows and, you know, people want to get in because growth is going, but then people want to get in because others are getting in. So, so that kind of snowballs into a, a positive uh, dynamic. Uh, on the e equity question, uh, I think it's a very good point. I think this is a big uh, problem in India because not just is there rising inequality across regions, there's also rising inequality across skill levels and so on. Uh, so, so that's a, a major challenge that uh, the authorities have to have to deal with. Uh, but, the, but the one thing I would say there, I think it's it's not very well known abroad, is that what has happened simultaneously in India while economic outcomes have become more unequal, there's been a huge equalization in what I would call social dignity because of the political process, you know, the hitherto marginalized classes have got access to the political process and they're doing lots of bad things, you know, like, you know, targeted stuff and so on, but fundamentally it represents, you know, uh, uh, an acquisition of, of, of dignity and, and stuff which I think is a, is a very healthy development. Um, 
I'll just comment on uh, Andrei Larionov's and the other question on uh, democracy. I'm rather more optimistic uh, uh, about this and uh, two studies uh, with regard uh, uh, to Russia. According to Freedom House, only seven countries, uh, se seven small oil states plus Singapore, are richer than Russia in per capita term and still authoritarian. So Russia is an extreme outlier. And why is this happening? Of course, the answer is oil. And uh, so you would expect uh, things to happen politically if the oil price falls. And Daniel Treisman of UCLA recently did a very interesting regression analysis where he found uh, convincingly that the popularity of the president in Russia depends on one single factor and that's the economic confidence index. And therefore you would expect uh, uh, something to happen in Russia politically whenever the situation becomes somewhat more difficult economically and the oil price goes down. Thank you. Well, I mainly want to talk about Bill Klein's question, which was the only one directed, direct, uh, directed towards me. Um, no, I don't think that uh, Brazil's underlying growth rate is now 6%. Um, the, the implicit uh, uh, figure that uh, I had included in that uh, calculation was actually 5.5%, but I think Brazil will have to continue raising its investment rate if it's to, in fact, achieve anything like that, anything over 5%. Um, at the moment, 4 to 5% seems to me the trend growth rate in Brazil and uh, a higher level is only going to be feasible if, in fact, the uh, investment rate rise, it continues to rise. It, 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 over the last year, the latest figure that I saw was an increase of 16% over the year in real terms. I think that's uh, not bad. Um, I, th I think the investment rate is now over 20%, but it's much more like 23% than like 40%. That is perfectly true. And it's going to have to rise somewhat if the growth rate is to be maintained. Let me also add one comment about uh, Andre Il Ilarionov. Uh, Andre's interesting question, um, which w w is that. Uh, his extrapolation, first of all, it, it assumes that uh, countries stay in their present state, and as Anders has already said, it's not clear that Russia is going to remain indefinitely a to totalitarian system. Um, it, or, and it, for that matter, I don't think it's clear that China is either. I think there's going to be, I think people do want to run themselves as they get richer, and in due course there will be pressures to liberalize in the case of China, and we don't know what's going to happen, whether that will happen peacefully as it did in Taiwan, or whether it will be traumatic as it has been in a number of other countries, or whether it will be repressed as it was in 1989. But uh, there are going to be pressures once again, and one shouldn't assume that uh, uh, these growth rates are going to continue indefinitely with no change in the political system. Okay, let me wrap it up with three comments on sort of the overview uh, side. Uh, Bert Kaidel asked what I thought was the significance of the relationship of reserves to domestic money supply in China as compared with the other countries. I think it's basically irrelevant. Uh, I think the main metrics against which you judge adequacy of foreign exchange reserves are trade levels that may need to be financed in terms of imbalances, maybe reliance on foreign capital. Um, in both cases, China is more open than the other countries we have here, so I'd give them a little uh, more leeway according to the norm. But uh, by any measure, uh, China's level of foreign exchange reserves is vastly vastly excessive to what could conceivably be needed. Now, of course, one might note that they've probably already taken a capital loss of something like half a trillion dollars um, on their holdings in terms of currency changes that have already occurred and losses in known investments. Um, they never mark to market and will never mark to market, so they won't come under any pressure for that, either domestically or internationally, and maybe that's some kind of markdown to the real value of their assets in some sense. But I think it's still fair to say their reserves are enormously excessive to any 
variable that one would ever use as a meaningful metric here. When we published our latest estimates, John and Bill Klein, estimates of fundamental equilibrium exchange rates uh, less than two months ago, the conclusion was that the renminbi was still undervalued by about 30 percent, uh, both against the dollar and against the weighted average of currencies, and uh, I don't see much change in that uh, uh, since that point. Um, Danny Leipziger, I think, raised a very profound question about the political impact of this rise in economic prominence of the trillion dollar club and indeed the emerging market economies more, op more, more broadly. As I said in my opening remarks, uh, I think that is one of the paramount challenges that the global economic system faces, how to integrate this group of countries into the existing order or, which would be my preference, to work with them to alter the rules of the game and the institutional foundations to uh, achieve a reformed international economic system that would engage these countries in a way that would be more effective, more responsive to their needs, and therefore more cognizant of the realities of today's global economy. Uh, in our new book, China's Rise, that, as I mentioned, we'll be uh, releasing in a couple of weeks, uh, my own chapter one is entitled China's Challenge to the Global Economic Order. And some of you may have seen an earlier version of that that I published in Foreign Affairs uh, a few months ago. Uh, there, with a focus on China, but one could broaden it to these other countries, uh, I posited the unsustainability of the current international economic system uh, given the fact that it is under some very fundamental challenge by China and some of the others, not only because of their increasing size and salience for the system, but because of their strong doubts about whether the system meets their needs uh, and whether they should comport to its rules and institutions since they had nothing to do with the creation of those rules and institutions. Uh, that, I think, is a very profound question. Uh, it's certainly one of our major topics of research and analysis here at the Institute, and I'm sure we'll want to feature it as one of the topics for a subsequent uh, item in this series. Finally, let me just make one comment on my own colleagues' comments. Um, I was struck how each of them, this was not rehearsed, uh, how each of them kind of stressed the downshift in, global, in growth rates for their countries, uh, which is certainly correct, and I have no challenge to that. But I would note that the forecast that each of them made for that downshifted growth in their countries is still pretty robust. Uh, China at eight, India at seven to eight, Russia at five to five and a half, Brazil five and a half to six. All that still looks pretty good by today's global uh, uh, metrics. Uh, it does add up, I think, to something on the order of six percent or more for the uh, emerging markets as a whole. And as I said earlier, since they account for about half the world economy now, uh, that looks like keeping the world economy at least reasonably robust despite the financial crisis and all that. However, by way of a preview, I will note that Arvind is going to systematically summarize all that at our global forecast session on Wednesday, uh, on Friday. Mike Moose is going to be putting it all in the uh, total global context. And as I mentioned at the outset, if you have not already received an invitation to that, we'd love to see you there. Thank you to the authors for today. Meeting adjourned.